In view of the recent changes made by the NMC as far as the question pattern is concerned, a lot of questions would now be asked on clinical pattern. That means a student should be able to diagnose a case, the student should be able to evaluate a question, and after evaluation of the question, the student should be able to arrive at a diagnosis. So a new series of questions, a new series of videos, which will be enabling the students of NEED PG and FMG to qualify or to appear or to prepare in a manner which is very best for the examination better. So there's a change of trend. Now today I have taken up a topic, taken up a subject from medicine and from pulmonology. So first of all, let's come and just study the question as it is asked in the recent pattern of examinations. So you can have a look and you can study the question. The question states, an obese young female comes to the OPD with a sudden onset of severe pleuritic chest pain and shortness of breath. That began few hours ago. She was taking tamoxifen for few years. So this is the first line of the question and you have to study each and everything very carefully. Then there are vital signs given and some of the things are marked in by underline, by underlining the test text. Now the pulse rate is increased. You see 133 per minute and respiratory rate 28 per minute. So the patient is presenting, a obese patient is presenting with a sudden onset of severe pleuritic chest pain and shortness of breath with tachycardia and tachypenia. And in addition, there is some lab value which is given. The respiratory alkalosis is seen on the ABG with hypoxia and hypocarbia and elevated alveolar arterial gradient. Now the options are, the answer options are pneumonia, pneumothorax, embolic phenomena and severe asthma. How to arrive, how to arrive at a diagnosis and how to answer this question, that is very important. Now, as I mentioned you, she's an obese lady, she's having a sudden onset of pain and what type of pain, chest pain, pleuritic type and shortness of breath and tachypenia and tachycardia with a history of some drug intake which is tamoxifen and the lab value showing hypoxia, hypocarbia and increased alveolar arterial gradient. So these are in nutshell some of the standard points. I guess for a student intelligent enough, this is more than enough what is needed to answer this question. Now option number one, pneumonia. If you just have a opinion or if you just have an idea about pneumonia. Pneumonia would most probably and most likely be presenting with cough, acute or chronic and there will be an increase in blood counts. See, TLC will be increased. In chronic cases, the lymphocyte count will be increased and over here, there will be a clinical, a clinical scenario of sepsis with fever. So there is nothing likely suggestive of a pneumonia condition, whether a bacterial pneumonia or a viral pneumonia or any other type of pneumonia. That is the second option, pneumothorax. Yes, pneumothorax with, will present with sudden onset of severe chest pain, not necessarily pleuritic type. There will be associated shortness of breath. There might be tachypenia and there might be tachycardia, but the ABG will not show such a uh, lab value over here. So that's important. There might be an associated traumatic injury associated with pneumo uh, pneumothorax, or there will be a history of chronic emphysema dysfunction of the lung. So that's very important. And you have to keep that in mind for the time being. Then we arrive at the third option D. We leave the option C for the time being. Severe asthma. Asthma most likely having an associated allergic pattern and there might be a history of exposure to certain allergens and all those things, a chronic history or there might be a clinical scenario like status asthmaticus in which a present might present with patient might present with uh, shortness of breath, silent chest in severe cases, but there will be a positive significant history. Uh, these things don't match. Now coming to the option C, there is something li uh, written like embolic phenomena. There is not a, di a direct diagnosis and many a time students get carried away because they think that this cannot be the answer. Now over here, the most likely answer as far as the history, as far as the lab values of the student concern, as per me, for the time being is an embolic phenomena. Why? Now coming to that. 
Now have a look how to arrive the the main crux of this class is how to arrive at a diagnosis. That's very important. Now I again reiterate the points of base, tachycardia, tachypenia, tamoxifen, very significant. Tamoxifen, there are certain drugs which predispose to an embolic phenomena, a thrombotic phenomena, and then from the thrombus and embolus can be derived. So there are certain drugs which are prothrombotic. That's important. So this clinical case has got a significant history of a drug intake which is thrombotic and there's an obese lady with all the clinical presentations of something which we call as the pulmonary thromboembolism. So that is very important. This is the way you arrive at a diagnosis. Now, in addition, the lab values you have to remember, as I mentioned, respiratory alkalosis with hypocarbia and hypoxia significantly seen in case of pulmonary thromboembolism. So this is how you differentiate the various options and how you arrive at a diagnosis. Now, why, why, why this question? Why this question? Because so many times, so many times, this pulmonary thromboembolism has been asked in NEET PG, has been asked in FMG, has been asked in so specialty examination so we should know more about this clinical condition and that's what we will be describing in detail so as far as the pulmonary embolism or pulmonary thromboembolism is concerned you have to remember that it is as a result usually which is asked a question as a result of thrombosis in the deep veins and from there the thrombolus is thrown into the upper part of the body so that means the deep vein thrombosis of the lower limbs and the pelvic veins and the cause basically is there so dvt is a predisposing factor for pulmonary embolism that's important now how do the patients present not essentially with all the symptoms i have placed this question with all the things which are a component of pulmonary thromboembolism but sometimes an examiner may just mislead you or will not point all the things in the question so that's important and you have to remember that patients usually present with sudden onset of breathlessness dyspnea tachycardia tachypenia so that's important in fact, anxiety is always a part of these things and substertal chest pain and mostly pleuritic type. Classical picture is a pleuritic type of chest pain. So what happens there is what we will be studying ahead is a ventilation perfusion mismatch which will be occurring. And in case there is an extent to a big ampullus, what it can do, it can lead to RVF, right ventricular failure. And that's what you have to keep in mind. So these are the things how a patient with pulmonary thromboembolus presence. So dyspnea is a very common symptom and sign, pleuritic chest pain, you have to remember tachypnea, tachycardia, and sometimes hemoptysis. So uh, there can be a variation in the symptomatology given by an examiner, hemoptysis with pleuritic chest pain with tachycardia. That can be an, another alternative clinical scenario. And then there is a compromise of cardiac output. And as I mentioned, right heart failure can ensue in severe cases. So these are how a patient presents. Now uh, I have given tamoxifen here as a clue with which you can arrive at a diagnosis but you have to remember under the other types of prothrombotic conditions and what are the increased age that is important in addition to tamoxifen sometimes estrogen therapy high dose estrogen therapy can predispose uh, patients to pulmonary thromboembolism immobility you know it here very well that immobility predisposes to pulmonary thromboopacity which is mentioned in this case pregnancy purpurium and varicose veins sometimes and in fact dvt is more significant than the varicose veins varicose veins also can cause pulmonary thromboembolism then trauma surgery which immobilize a patient for a long period of time especially the surgery of the lower limbs and the pelvis and especially certain malignancies which predispose to prothrombotic conditions of pelvis, abdomen, and metastatic lesions can also be a causative factor of pulmonary thromboembolism. Now, you know Bassett syndrome, homocystinuria, nephrotic, lupus antigoglet, PNH, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, polycythemia, and recent MI, which predispose any condition which causes immobility and which is prothrombotic. And these are all the risk factors for pulmonary thrombosis. These are to be remembered because these are procoagulant states. Now, defective inhibition of coagulant factors, you have to remember factor 5 late mutation, antithrombin 3 deficiency protein, C protein, S 
thrombin gene mutations because these all are studied in hematology as procoagulant states. So these apply not only to pulmonary thromboembolism, these, uh, these apply to general thrombosis as well. So that's important. Now, another feature which uh, might not have been placed in my clinical scenario, but which can be asked in a different clinical scenario, is the changes, the ECG changes and the radiographic changes. So, as far as the ECG is concerned, I told you tachycardia and tachycardia can manifest well in ECG as well as sinus tachycardia and may show poor RVA progression. So, that is important, in, especially in the anterior leads. So, that is to be remembered worthwhile. Right ventricular stain pattern. And one important thing, very, very frequently asked, this S1Q3T3 pattern. So this is very important. I have seen so many questions being asked. What, why, what is the S1Q3T3 pattern? So you see T wave inversion in lead 6 to lead 6 to V4. And then also you see this pattern. S1Q3T3 pattern is almost classic of pulmonary thromboembolism. Now there may be new onset atrial fibrillation, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter. So you have varying pattern of a right excess deviation or right bundle branch block. So all these features may be associated with pulmonary thromboembolism. And now important what has been asked again so many times, so many times that there, what does a radiograph of the chest how can it, although very difficult to pick up, it can be picked up by specialists only or having a long time training in dealing with these cases, that there will be decreased vascular markings in the area of the obstruction. That means there will be this oligo oligemic area in which the blood supply is less. So focal oligemia and vest mark sign, it is given by the name vest mark sign. Vest mark sign happens to be a classic finding in case of pulmonary thromboembolism, in case of a radiograph of the chest. So remember that. And sometimes there there may be a wedge shaped pleural based density which we give the name is Hampton's hump. So Hampton's hump and Westmark sign on radiograph are classic signs of pulmonary thromboembolism and prominent pulmonary knuckle which is associated with pulmonary hypertension can be seen in pulmonary thromboembolism in addition to pleural effusion sometimes. Now, but you have to remember that chest radiograph is not a chest x-ray is not a important a specific diagnostic modality of diagnosing pulmonary thrombi. What is important is the ventilation perfusion scan and the pulmonary angiography. So that is to be kept in mind. So the most important definite diagnosis is by virtue of pulmonary angiography. Now, initial investigation of choice, once a patient comes into the emergency with suspected pulmonary thromboembolism, what you do, you just either a lung scan, a ventilation perfusion scan or a CT scan just with intravenous contrast, which can show the typical features of pulmonary thromboembolism as mentioned earlier. Now, pulmonary angiography happens to be a gold standard, uh, but it, it, it is not the first investigation of choice in most of the cases because many centers are not equipped with facilities for pulmonary angiography. So you have to remember, so what are the initial investigation and what is the investigation of choice? So there's a difference between the initial investigation and the investigation of choice. You have to remember in certain cent centers, the uh, digital subtraction angiography, DSA can also be done. So it depends upon the facilities where you are situated. Now, as you can see, you can get an image-based question about pulmonary thromboembolism. I told you it's a very important question and you can have a whole range of questions, image-based questions on it, lab value-based questions, symptomatology questions, how you can arrive at a diagnosis. So that's important. And over here, you can see in the arrow, this is the Hampton's hump. In the case of over here, it's already marked and I again mark it, the Hampton's hump in the patient with pulmonary thromboembolism. The chest radiograph shows a wedge-shaped opacity. So this is a wedge-shaped opacity over here. I can just delineate over here. This is the wedge-shaped opacity or the Hampton's hub, which is clearly seen on radiograph of the chest. CT scan, it's very difficult for uh, PE students to pick up. But over here, the area marked on the arrow over here is shown as the Hampton's hump in, radio in the CT scan as well. Now over here, Westmark sign. I just mentioned Westmark sign, Hamptonson, clearly asked by many examiners. And over here, you can see it is marked in here in a patient with an asterisk mark. So while the asterisk mark is there, you can have a focal oligemia of the lung architecture in there. So this is Westmark sign, which is well shown over here. Now, this is the uh, real-time picture of an uh, angiogram showing pulmonary. You can see in the arrow marks uh, obstruction and you can see that there's a decrease in the distal 
blood flow in the distal parts and this is well marked as a pulmonary embolism in one of the bigger segments of the pulmonary vessel so this is pulmonary embolism shown in real time by a angiogram now basically this is the main crux because treatment modalities they are super specialization things and you might not be asked much about the treatment part of the pulmonary thromboembolism but for uh, general purposes you have to remember that the first thing because patient is presenting with breathlessness dyspnea so oxygen is the first thing which you have to give you have to ensure that the hypoxia is corrected because hypoxia ha happens to be a manifest ma uh, manifestation of pulmonary thrombosis. so you correct the hypoxia by giving an oxygen uh, by mass and IV heparin in most of the cases should be uh, given in the initial to maintain PTT between 1.5 and 2 times the normal value so heparin in most of the cases heparin is though there are so many drugs which have come up but heparin happens to be a very nice drug for treatment of pulmonary thromboembolism uh, still so that's to be remembered and once we're in specialist centers we give these thrombolytic agents like the streptokinase or TPA so this is to be remembered once that we stabilize the patient the hypoxia is corrected then we begin with heparin or streptokinase or other thrombolytic therapy but main thing for our students to remember is the pulmonary thromboembolism as a clinical condition and it is a very important question frequently asked question favorite of examiners and we expect this question in your future examinations as well i hope this roundup about pulmonary thromboembolism and more than that how to arrive at the diagnosis of a clinical stereo is important so i hope that this would benefit you a lot thanks a lot